Our next guest is Jerry Diaz. He's the national president of Unifor. And as, as national president, Jerry's at the forefront of the fight for workers' rights, equality, and social, social justice. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us to share your insights, polish off that webcam. Uh, maybe you'll, even you'll share some, some hopes and dreams about the future of work. Welcome. Uh, my pleasure to be here, Bass. Thank you very much. And hello, hey. Ed. How are you today? Very, very good. Great to see you and um, looking forward to a um, robust discussion. Robust is one of the most overused words of uh, the early 21st century, I think. So uh, lively. I'm looking for lively. Um, Jerry, look, I, 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 in a few minutes, I want to talk about the auto industry, which is one of the original industries of Unifor, which, of course, is uh, uh, the product of a merger uh, um, some years back now. And I want to talk very particularly about EVs. But for starters, uh, because your union is so broad and because you're in manufacturing, in services, in resources, it gives you sight lines into a lot of sectors as we're coming out of this, um, out of this pandemic. And I'm just wondering what the recovery is looking like from you and what lessons you might be drawing about the future of work as you're uh, watching all these different sectors. Well, there's no question the pandemic had a huge impact on our organization, just like it did across union and businesses globally. At one time, we had out of our 315,000 members, we had over 100,000 people, 100,000 members on layoff um, during the pandemic. Um, so right now we'll probably have about 35, 40,000 members on layoff. You know, really members in the airline industry and in the service sector are members that work in casinos, um, hotels. We can walk right through the list. So in my opinion, uh, the future is, it, it, look, it's, it's pretty bleak in certain industries. Like I, I couldn't even predict how many years it'll take for the airline sector to get back to where it was pre-pandemic. How many years is it going to take for people to feel comfortable traveling? Uh, what's the hotel industry going to look like? Uh, how often, uh, when will people feel comfortable going back into casinos? So I'm just, I'm talking about some of our members that have been negatively impacted. But I think what the pandemic has also done, Ed, it really has shown us, you know, who the essential workers really are, who the most important workers really are. And I think it shows the discrepancy. And I think it, it has also exposed the lack of respect that the workers we depend on day in, day out to get on a regular basis. I think about their economy. I think about their wages. I think about how they've been left behind, how they've been taken advantage of. And so I'm thinking and I'm talking about our members that work in long-term care facilities that are making a little above minimum wage, who have been destined to precarious part-time non-standard jobs. And we saw what happened as, as our members in long-term care facilities had to have two, three jobs in order to make ends meet transferred COVID from one long-term facilities to another long-term facilities to another long-term. And what have we done about it? Nothing. Yeah. I think about our members in grocery stores, I can walk through the list, so fire away. Well, I, I, I was just gonna actually make a reference to grocery stores because, um, uh, you know, I, I actually used to work in a grocery store uh, through high school. And, uh, and grocery store clerks became heroic figures, uh, as you say, essential service uh, workers um, through this. I wonder two things about that. I wonder if you think that has staying power, that kind of social respect that was, uh, that was gained. And secondly, I wanna talk about technological change because even grocery store clerks are subject, and I wanna talk this more broadly as well, but you know, we're seeing a lot of um, changes in the industry and digitalized changes that have been um, amplified and accelerated by, uh, by this. So how, um, how concerned are you that, uh, well, the technological change is really the, you know, the big issue for you? Okay, well, first of all, let me start with the grocery stores and then get to the whole issue of tech change. Well, look, I remember, like I'm 62 years old, I remember 
uh, when I was younger. I remember as a teenager, as a young adult, that grocery store jobs were good middle class jobs, good working class. I mean, they were paid well, respected, and then over time with the introduction of the discount stores and frankly, with the manifestation of complete greed from the Loblaws, the Sobeys, uh, the Metro stores, wages dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. And it drives me crazy when I see like the Weston family on the rate sitting on $8 billion worth of wealth, cutting pandemic pay from their employees that have made them even more profits during the pandemic than the years before. So that's okay. Let's now let me get off my, my, my soapbox in that regard before this discussion starts to get very off key as it relates to greed. But I'm not afraid of technology at all, which I think will probably surprise a lot of people because there's this mindset that unions live in the past, that we're Neanderthals, that we just can't get with the changing times. And I argue just the opposite. I'm very concerned if companies don't invest. I'm very concerned if companies don't invest in new technology. So to me, I'm more afraid of what happens if you don't play, as opposed to the impact that it will have on jobs. Because I will argue that yes, jobs will be negatively impacted in some regards, but also leads to the creation of other jobs. So, you know, we've been dealing with technology forever. I think about the auto industry, you go all the way back to the introduction of the assembly line. So we've been, so dealing with new technologies and, and the impact that it has on working class people is not new. Um, but what we have to make sure of is that working class people are a part of the discussion. Uh, so that working people can be brought along with the changes to be trained with the implementation of the new technology. So it really has to be a broad based discussion between all levels of governments, the corporate community, the labor movement, with workers being, in my opinion, the center of the discussion, because uh, without working people, there's not going to be one cent of profit made anywhere. Yeah, you know, we've done some work together. Um, uh, uh, Unifor and PPF around the newspaper industry, and PPF is also very active in uh, the energy industry uh, transition uh, discussion. And, um, you know, those industries are changing. I mean, there's just, uh, uh, you know, no way that the status quo holds there. So it's interesting to hear that you're not the proponent of the status quo. Uh, does that make you the proponent of a term that some people use that uh, sort of, I find a little off-putting, but, you know, the just transition. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because just transition means a variety of different things. If I'm a, if I'm a worker in the, uh, in the, in the uh, oil and energy industry, if I'm working in Fort McMurray for Suncor, when I hear the term just transition, I view it as I'm losing my job. Yeah. As opposed to what does it mean? Does it mean that we're going to have the conversation about what happens with the eventuality of a changing economy? Um, if we believe that climate change is a real issue, which I do, and I also believe that it's the issue for the generation, then we better start having the conversation about what's going to happen with the transformation from fossil fuels uh, to clean uh, to clean electricity. So we have so just transition can't just be a catchy phrase that you know scares the hell out of people. It has to be the starting of the, just, uh, the, of the dialogue as to what does it really mean? So if, if we are conscious of, of what we have done to the world and the harm that we inflicted upon it, and we believe that climate change is an issue, which it is, well, then what are we going to do? How are we going to transition? What are the jobs that are going to be for a greener economy? How do we start to transition it? How do we start talking to um, our members, workers in industries that we know, frankly, are in long-term peril? So, uh, I, I want to come, I want to go right down that point. Uh, I will say, because I said I found just transition off-putting, I think I should explain. I find it off-putting because it's easy to say just transition if you're not the person going through the transition. And it could be, as you just said, Jerry, it could be a substitute for action. Uh, slogans are, are, uh, are, are not policy. 
Um, so, uh, so that's problematic. But I, I, I want to go down the point uh, that you're raising right now because um, I was watching during the pandemic. I was watching uh, television and not only Netflix, and I was watching a documentary on CBC called Company Town, and it was about GM's decision to close the plant in Oshawa. And I recognize, and perhaps we'll talk about it later, that uh, that there's new action in Oshawa, which is you know you know great for your workers, obviously. Um, but that plant looms very big in the Canadian imagination. And it featured in our first BNW, first Brave New Work conference, actually. So I want to play one clip now. I'll play one clip later from that, just as an audio clip uh, uh, for the audience. And, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question coming out of the clip, OK? So if we could just roll the clip first. There, there's a lot of academics and the textbook socialists out there that have all these great ideas. <laughs> And they've been talking about these fantastic ideas for generations. Hasn't really come to fruition. We, I can bring together as many workers as I can. And we're not going to pull together a billion dollars to start an assembly plant. I mean, it, it just, it's, it sounds great in theory, but the practical reality of it is, like, give me a break. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the feedback on that, but, um, but you know, when I was listening to you talking about that, I was wondering, you and many people in the union have grown up where the existential struggle is worker against employer. And has that changed? Is the existential struggle today nation against nation and having to have workers, industry, government, figuring out strategies together uh, if we're going to compete as a nation? Um, is, do unions play a different role now? Um, no, look, I think we've always been a part of the discussion, and I think we need to be a, a broader part of the discussions in the future, and here's what I mean. Look, work is changing, uh, but the challenges, by and large, continue to exist. So the, the, the whole question of what companies do, how they react, uh, their pendulums for hoarding the money as opposed to sharing it. Um, the preoccupation by not playing by the rules, I will, I will argue. Um, and then what do governments do about it? So for example, you've, you've we're just, you know, you, you talked about company town, but you also talked about the media file. And you talked about Netflix and Google and Facebook. So here's, here's, here's companies that are making money hand over fist without contributing a dime. Uh, here's companies that I will argue will take all of the information compiled by the conventional traditional news media and don't pay a nickel for it. So we've got we've had about 250 to 300 local newspapers of close in the last 10 years. Uh, but if the advertising, the digital advertising dollars that are all going to Google, Netflix and, and Facebook, if that revenue was distributed from those that they stole them the information from, uh, then we'd have a much stronger media sector in this country today. Um, so to me, you can't have a strong democracy in a country without a strong media. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, you need different voices. And look, I, I, I just think that there has to be an element of fairness. And that's why when I talk about the roles of unions, governments, we, we all have to get to work because there's a solution for journalism in this country. And it's about taxing those that are sucking up all the revenue dollars that don't pay for it. So, uh, you know. I, 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 I'm happy to say we've, you know, along with other uh, others who've been around our shattered mirror process, have had some success there in getting some of those, uh, uh, a labor tax credit, for instance, which is something with a group of 10 of us that Unifor was part of, people from yep. industry, people from unions, others. Um, there's more work to be done there. Uh, and, uh, uh, some of it's actually in recommendation one of the Shattered Mirror, which I recommend to people, uh, because I think it's time is, uh, is, is coming around now. Um, I, I just want to switch into, into one area of change, which is uh, in the auto industry and particularly electric vehicles. And, you know, you've had a lot of activity yourself uh, around this issue over the last uh, number of months. I think at one point you said that... Um, You'll personally, you know, purchase an electric vehicle when your members are actually making them, and uh, I'm wondering 
those recent Ford and Chrysler announcements. Are you, you think we're getting close to that point? I think we are. I think um, if you take a look at the Cami plant, they'll be building the EV600, which is a uh, passenger vehicles that'll be used by Correlator, Amazon, so the, the commercial vehicles, but I'm expecting um, that by 2023, 2024, um, EV vehicles will be rolling off the assembly line. 2026, probably in Oakville. Uh, before that, like I said, in Windsor. So yeah, I have zero interest in, in, in buying an electric vehicle made in any other country besides Canada. And the first electric vehicle I have will be made clearly by our members. Um, will this be a different kind of work for those members? Do they have to reskill for this? I mean, there's fewer parts in an electric vehicle. There's, uh, um, you know, do we need both fewer workers, I suppose, and do we need workers to have uh, new sets of skills? Well, you know, assembling a vehicle, those skills aren't going to really change much. I mean, that type of work will be the same, but there will be less jobs for sure. In a traditional ICE, internal combustible engine, you're looking at about 1,400 parts. Uh, if you're looking at a battery electric vehicle, you're looking at about 250 parts. So there will be significantly less. Like for example, you're not gonna need transmissions. You're not gonna need cooling systems. You're not gonna need, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the cooling systems are different. Like I said, the batteries as opposed to your traditional uh, in your transmissions. But there'll be other types of work, right? There's different types of components. You're gonna have electrical drive units, inverters, converters, you know, heating, cooling systems, all kinds of other different stuff. So it'll be a hodgepodge for sure. But like I said, there may be less jobs, but I'm more concerned if the com companies don't invest. We were, look, Ed, we were heading in the wrong direction in this country. We used to be number five in the world in auto assembly, number five. Right now we're 12 or 13. So this is an opportunity, frankly, to reboot. This is an opportunity. We negotiated about $6 billion worth of investments of which the lion's share will be transitioning to electric vehicles. Uh, we are incredibly concerned because up until bargaining last year, the global automakers had announced over $300 billion in EV investments and not one nickel, not one nickel in Canada. So that has changed, it changed in a significant way. And, and like they say, if they build it, if you know, if they build it, they will come. I, I never did buy that you know, field of dreams argument, uh, but I do believe it when it comes to the auto industry, because if you have an assembly plant that's gonna be around, the auto parts suppliers come. Okay, well, I guess that's what I was, uh, what I'm trying to get a little bit in this Team Canada and working together uh, approach. And clearly in the NAFTA negotiations, that's the kind of approach that uh, uh, that you had to take. So what will it take to have, um, I'm going to say an auto pack to a, you know, for the new um, auto industry? Well, first of all, we have to keep an eye. I'm not too sure if we're going to be heading back to the auto pack. That would be I would certainly be in favor of it. Um, I have no idea how the, uh, you know, the WTO can strike down something like that. I think it's ridiculous. But anyway, uh, I think it's about fairness. But I, I'm, what I'm concerned about, frankly, is, is what Biden is talking about doing or what they may do. Um, I'm concerned about some of the positions he's taken on Buy America, uh, the impact that they'll have on the Canadian auto industry. So I really think that it's, it, it's a question of, of, of everybody getting in a room um, and start talking about this industry. If you, if you look at the auto industry, it's if the border doesn't exist, where you have some components that will cross the border three, four, five times before they get assembled on a vehicle. So unless you're expecting a major disruption in Canada or the United States, I would suggest that that can't change. And I don't expect it will. Um, so, you know, we should... I'm concerned about some of the some of the rhetoric that's coming out of the U.S., um, but Canada is going to have to be very strong and focused in how they deal with the Biden administration on this important industry. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I always try to think of you know what are our bargaining levers. Uh, I'm sure I don't think of it nearly as much as you do in your uh, in in the kind of work that uh, that you do. 
And, you know, a lot of people are talking about rare earths, critical minerals. Um, yep. Do we have electricity advantages in our clean electricity? So uh, where do you see those levers and how do we apply them? Well, you know what? You're, you're dead on. I mean, we have been so content to be a branch plant economy. And we have, it's almost as if we have this, you know, inferiority complex when it comes to the United States. Like, I, I just can't understand why we have always been so comfortable, you know, being the drawers of water and hewers of wood. So here we are a nation, you know, surrounded, you know, three coasts with water, rich in raw materials, natural, we got it all, all yet. As a nation, I will say we get an F in as a grade for how it comes to developing our economy because we always depend on others. Take a look at the pandemic. We couldn't even provide the most basic safety for ourselves. We couldn't even make a damn mask, personal protective equipment, had no vaccines, nothing. Our entire safety was offshore was offloaded, was outsourced, everything. So now we're sitting there taking a look at it and hopefully we're going, hey, hold on here. Hmm. We have the ability, the technology, the whereabouts, the raw materials, natural resources. Why don't we use that to be the footprint of our economy? Why wouldn't we utilize our strengths? So when our dealings with the United States, if we're talking about the auto industry and we're talking about electric vehicles, what do we have that they want? Everything, nickel, aluminum, lithium, magnesium, four of the major components for batteries. And we have it in abundance. Take a look but at we do, but, but we don't have a battery plant or any plant. Oh, but we will. I, you know what, if I was a gambler, which I'm not, I, look, uh, if there's one thing that the governments are talking about, I'm talking about the federal government, and frankly, I give uh, Doug Ford, I'm very, I don't give him much credit, but the reality is, is he's spending a lot of time talking about in, uh, investing in a battery plant. So people, the governments understand that, look, if you want a long-term sustainable auto industry in this country, then you better build batteries. And they know that. And so they are very active, both levels of government. Um, and I'm saying that quite emphatically and enthusiastically because every time I speak to the different levels of government, whether it's the premier or the prime minister, uh, they talk about doing everything they can to attract um, a battery manufacturer. Now, for example, I know Magna has the technology. They developed it and have it and had it in Europe. So if I take a look at Magna's and Martin Rias, some of the more successful uh, Canadian uh, auto parts companies, it's just a, a question of getting everybody in a room and saying, look, we want this done. So how much is that going to cost? So I think we need to use our strengths. I, 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 we can't back off to the United States. We can't say, oh, look, no problem. Like you can continue hammering us with this, with, uh, over the softwood lumber dispute. You can talk about um, giving incentives uh, in, in buy, to book for Americans to buy American built vehicles. You can talk about all these other things, which will cause us grief here in Canada. And then at the same time, we just open the doors and say, take anything you want. There's gonna to have to be some hardball negotiations. Yeah, well, let's get that room together and get everybody in it. Um, right now we have an even bigger room. Uh, and I wanna to go to some of the audience questions because there's a lot of people here who, uh, who you know, wanna hear from you on, on a variety of things. So. Uh, first audience question here is, how can policymakers ensure reform don't hinder the success of gig workers and their ability to capitalize on flexibility and indeed um, independence? Uh, is there a role for unions here? So uh, this is a pro option of gig worker, which may not agree with, I don't know, we'll leave it to you, and a sense of is there a role for unions with gig workers? Well, it's interesting because there's no question there is a role for unions as it relates to gig workers. I'm thinking about, um, well, let me even back up. Let me go to the first part of the question. Look, there are a lot of gig workers that like the flexibility associated with it. But I will argue that all workers want good jobs. They want good full-time jobs. 
There are some people that like the flexibility, don't want to work 40 hours a week. Um, but I will say that's the minority, not the majority. Because young people are no different than us. Young people, listen, I like the idea that when I started work in the manufacturing sector in the late 70s, that there was a very good chance that I was going to retire from that plant with a decent pension. And I'll say that young people today just want the same. They want a good paying job. This whole argument about, oh, they love the transparency. They love to bounce from one job to another job to another job to another job and have all that flexibility. That's BS. Young people today want good jobs. They want good pay. And they want to be able to provide for their families, which means a, a steady income over many years. So if you take a look at some of the gig workers that we're talking to, if we talk about Uber drivers, if you talk about, you know, you know, there's there's different gig workers out there uh, that that we are talking to because they want a union. Uh, we have a freelance a freelancer section of, of our organization where we have people who, uh, who are members who don't belong to your traditional workplace, yet still like the idea of being able to pool their resources. Um, we have a lot of freelancers that, like I said, do work for the media sector, do uh, freelance work in different sectors, but they still want a voice and they still want some leverage. So I will argue that gig workers are no different than anything else. We better find a way to incorporate them in the country in the economy because look, if you, if you follow the pandemic, which we have so many people started working from home and in the beginning, wow, it was great. I don't have to get my butt out of bed and hop in the car and drive an hour through Toronto traffic to get to work. But here we are 15 months later and people view it as, as living from work. People wanna get the heck out of the house. People need uh, some mental stimulation. People like that work environment. They like to get out of the house. So. There's a lot of discussions going on. Okay, let me go to second question here uh, from the audience. And I have, I do have several. And I think it alludes perhaps to your comments earlier about um, not being afraid of technological change, wanting companies to invest in, in, uh, in productivity improvements, I suppose. So it says, how should compensation and you know, wages and compensation change to reflect ever increasing productivity? And I guess that implies that productivity perhaps is not captured uh, uh, properly in wages. Well, first of all, I believe in free collective bargaining. That's why I have a problem with the system in Mexico uh, where there's anything but free collective bargaining. Um, I think that you know, there's, a, there's a definite need for, I will argue, more unionization in society. It's not as if we're heading down a system or, 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 or raw capital has proven uh, I will argue historically that, look, it's not many companies, and I'm generalizing now, but not many companies uh, want to share. Um, it's very much a, a, a question of extracting through collective bargaining. And like I said, I'm generalizing. There's a, a lot of good companies out there that you know, take a look at their profitability and make sure they pay their workers accordingly uh, based on their profitability. But I will argue uh, that that is not the norm. Um, I will argue that, you know, the only real way in the ticket to that type of fairness is through free collective bargaining. Right. Okay, I have, to, I have a couple of questions, you know, about upskilling and they uh, they relate to each other, reskilling, upskilling. So, you know, one is very simply, what role do unions have in upskilling? And related to that is, have you seen any good examples of effective retraining for workers impacted by technology. Okay, so unions, we will, like, let me give an example. In Detroit 3 bargaining, we just negotiated advanced technology committees because the auto industry is changing quicker than anybody thought. And if, if we are going to deal with the changing technology, A, we want to know about it, but B, if our members see that the union leadership is not afraid with the changes and frankly is embracing it, it gives our members an element of comfort that, look, it can't be all that bad. Because generally when you talk about new technology, people associate it with job loss. Um, so for us, it's a real question of understanding what the technology is, and then start to talk to our members about the necessity uh, for training. So we like to be a part of it. We like to be the train the trainers. 
We like to be the ones that will deliver the training to our members. So when, when you're talking about upskilling, um, then we want to be a part of the process because I will argue it eliminates a lot of the uncertainty and fear. So like I've said many times throughout this conversation, I'm more afraid of companies that don't invest than those that do uh, because yes, work will be different. If I take a look at the auto industry, I bet about 95% of all jobs will be impacted. And some will say there's going to be job loss as a result of it. And the answer is yes. Uh, but there will be different jobs created as a result of it as well. So it's a hodgepodge. So 20 years ago or so, we had um, sector councils that uh, that had a role here, had a mandate. Is that a, um, is that a model that used to exist that would be good uh, in future again? Hold on, just let me... Sorry about this for a second, Ed. Uh, a part of the last question too was, you know, different types of technology that has been a benefit. And look, there's a workplaces today are are much more ergonomically advanced. Uh, so some of the traditional heavy lifting that was done, and I can walk through a variety of different assembly plants, manufacturing facilities, um, even the way uh, some of the service sector is done. So technology, I will argue, has taken away some of the real heavy lifting. Um, I, could, I can give you a lot more other examples. Some, you know, in some manufacturing facilities, some of the jobs that were very unsafe have been replaced by robotics. So yes, it may have replaced some of the manual labor, but it created jobs to repair the robotics. So those are just some examples. Go ahead with your next question, Ed. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, 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 that's that's interesting because uh, you know it makes me think again about the skill sets that are required and how they change. And you know, I, I recall now that you're speaking at the time that Osho was uh, announced for closure in 2018, 2019. Um, GM was hiring uh, engineers at Markham for. Uh, you know, for very, maybe you could explain what they do at Markham for people. And I'm wondering if that kind of rebalancing uh, of skills and education knowledge is going to be a continuing feature of the industry. You know, it's interesting. When GM announced uh, the, uh, the, the training center, or excuse me, the, uh, the engineering center in Markham, I'll never forget the, the big announcement. It was, uh, yeah, Trudeau was there. Kathleen Wynne was there. Um, Steve Carlisle was the head of GM Canada at the time. And I remember saying to Trudeau, you better make sure that they don't announce the opening of an engineering facilities in Markham, while at the same time looking to close Oshawa. So anyway. That was prescient. I kind of um, did that one. But the bottom line is, is what do they do there? I mean, it's one of the, I will argue, one of the jewels of GM. Um, for example, engineers there are, are are on the leading edge of, you know, developing the autonomous vehicles. Um, they really are they're talking about what the next generations are going to be, uh, be like. Uh, probably within the next ten years, about thirty million cars around the globe will have five G technology in it. So you know, when you start looking at, you know, five G technology, what it means as it relates to connectability, uh, you know, when you when you think about a vehicle in the not so distant future. You know, when you talk about 5G, you're looking at about 50% of a vehicle will be computers. 50% of the cost of a car will be straight computers. So Markham is really on the leading edge of all of that. And I know that they, they put into place a test track in the back of Austin. So our argument always was, look, if you're gonna have a thousand engineers in Markham and you're gonna put a, a test track in Oshawa to test autonomous vehicles, why in the heck wouldn't you put workers back in Oshawa uh, to build those vehicles, those autonomous vehicles? So obviously those are conversations we're going to be having with GM on an ongoing basis. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to have time maybe for one or two more audience questions and I want to go back and play a last clip and ask you something uh, off that. And I do have a question, important question, particularly this, uh, uh, this week as uh, Indigenous History Week about the resources industry. And the question is, how can Canada ensure we honor our obligations to Indigenous peoples as we draw on our natural resources to become more self-sufficient? How do we ensure Indigenous self-determination self is not undermined? Well, it, it can't be. The bottom line is, is that 
indigenous communities have to be a part of the discussion right from the beginning. Um, and they can't be left behind. I mean, it, look, I have workplaces in Manitoba that are located in indigenous communities. And if you look at the makeup of the workplace, maybe 5% of the workforce is made up of, 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 you know, of, of our members from the community. It's absolutely outrageous that we can have a workplace right in a community and yet only have 5% of the workforce reflected. Doesn't make any sense. It's, as a matter of fact, it's embarrassing and it's insulting. So the discussion has to be had right from the beginning. And Indigenous communities have to be a part of the decisions, the discussions, and the solutions. And that doesn't happen by being excluded from the planning phase. All right. Um, um, I'm going to go back to Company Town. And, uh, and I do have a question here that strikes on it as I move into this clip, which is how, you know, how do we redistribute wealth without companies leaving town. So does that become a threat? And how do we find that balance? Well, first of all, I mean, when government, first of all, I think governments have to be active um, in investments. I think governments have to play a role. Um, it was interesting because one thing about the pandemic, I, I never saw the most, of, you know, the, I, I never saw so many entrepreneurs putting their hands out. I never saw and heard so many people that criticized governments, said governments keep away from me. Uh, we don't want any government involvement. You know, it's all about free enterprise and get out of the way, putting their hands out saying, please, I need some money. So boy, I never saw the most ardent conservative become raging socialists overnight until the pandemic yet anyway, just have a little fun, obviously. But look, there also has to be uh, some discussions. I believe in governments playing a role. I believe in governments investing in the auto industry. I believe in governments investing in the aerospace industry. I believe governments playing an active role. Uh, but they also have to be able to say, and they also have to be able to bargain that says, if we're gonna contribute to the job creation, then you're not going anywhere. So I think they have to be very specific um, as it relates to what expectations are. And I think consumers also have to be, uh, I think, play an active role. I think companies that show absolutely no loyalty to Canadians, we should show no loyalty to them. Uh, so many companies will leave Canada and chase the dollar uh, in third world countries because they, workers can be exploited, yet they're free to dump their products in Canada and we happily buy them. So I think there has to be some social responsibility. I think we need to have those types of conversations. And one thing that happened, because Canadians are loyal, when GM announced that they were closing Oshawa back in 2018. GM went from number one in sales in Canada to number four. Canadians are loyal and uh, they watched it and they thought it was unfair. How could GM be the number one selling, you know, number one in sales in Canada and yet they're leaving? So Canadians took it personally. So I think there has to be a lot more of that. Um, uh, as it relates to uh, Canadian education on industry, who does what, when, who's left, why. So I think it's a broader discussion, Ed. Okay, I want to. I want to. I'm going to finish on on one last point too, uh, and 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 roll this um, short clip of you and your father uh, speaking. And for those who don't know your father, uh, you're a second generation union leader in this country. Uh, your father was a. Uh, was involved in De Havilland aircraft, involved in a, uh, a famous uh, strike at, uh, at De Havilland, for which I think as a young teenager, you made sandwiches, if I, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, we're talking real human beings here. Policy always touches on real human beings. We're talking about workers and the impacts on them and the impacts on their representatives. So let me roll the clip and then ask you this question. Um, the clip, please. But do I feel good about it? No. Do I feel I let people down? Absolutely, because I did. You shouldn't feel that way anyway. Yeah, but I do. The bottom line is, is I do. People were expecting something better. My own niece and nephew for crying out loud. 
So leaving aside for a moment uh, that the GM story has turned up now, uh, but you know, sometimes we live in a world, there's so much stress, there's so much change, there's so much unpredictability. Uh, there's not really a line between work disruption and personal psychological uh, uh, disruption and, and damage. So I just want to ask about this emotional toll about the future work. How will people bear it? How, how do you bear it? I'm a bit of a different bird when it comes to pressure. I, I, I really, things bother me that I can control and I screw up, then I'm determined to fix it. But things that I can't control, I don't, you know, lose a ton of sleep over it. Now, the whole GM Oshawa was personal for me because my father lives in Oshawa, two of my sisters, niece and nephew. I got a lot of family in Oshawa. My mother's buried in Oshawa. So for me, it was personal. And we knew that it was a, a, a David versus Goliath sort of a situation. But frankly, losing wasn't an option or having the plant closed wasn't an option. And when it became inevitable, I took it personally. It wasn't my decision, did everything I could to change it, but I couldn't stop it. And so, you know, the earlier clip, when I talked about, you know, um, you know, look, basically we don't live in a world of, of unicorns and rainbows. Like I've got to be realistic as to what's doable and what's not. I mean, a lot of people are criticizing, saying we should have been pushing for employee ownership and all that other stuff. The bottom line is that doesn't work, not in a major industry where you need billions to invest just in technology, yet alone in equipment. So look, work is changing and it's gonna to continue to change. But coming out of this, we have to be a part of the conversation or nothing's gonna work properly. And, and I think that's the takeaway from today. The take it away from today is that we need to have discussions as governments, as companies, as unions, as academia. We all have to get in the room and figure out what it's going to look like. And then when we understand what it looks like, then we can start to train people uh, so that we are, are ready uh, for the changing technology. Right. And if we don't get that right, you're seeing manifest in mental health. You see it manifest in populist politics. Um, uh, are those the are those the prices of, uh, of, of, of not getting it right? It is the price of not getting it right. I mean, uncertainty is problematic for everybody. The uncertainty is tough on workers, but I'll argue uncertainty is, is tough on corporations as well, because everybody likes an element of predictability in their life. And so we can do this if we do this thing together. It's, it's when you have a, a collection of free agents uh, that don't look and take into account um, the, 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 the wants of others uh, that we end up going down the wrong road. Well, Jerry, I want to thank you so much um, for participating. I, I would like to thank you for your candor, but I think you have no control over it. I think it's embedded in your personality. So uh, uh, it's not willful, it's uh, automatic. So um, I thank you for it. Um, uh, nonetheless, and as I said to Andrew vis TD, you know, I, um, PPF enjoys working with uh, Unifor. It enjoys having diverse perspectives uh, uh, at our tables and, and you know, those who are intellectually um, interested in how we're going to make the future work, uh, you know, all um, are due to be commended. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the pleasure of, of being able to speak with you today and my participation. Thank you.